Tuesday, pull routine. 7 sets of 12 pull-ups, 24 biceps curls, 24 dumbbell pullover. Audio during workout is frags of Asimov, Celine, Dostoevsky, Bulgakov, Kuchnia, Schopenhauer, David Graeber, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Truman Capote. Audio of this video is first chapter of The Dawn of Everything. The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber and David Wengro Chapter 1 Farewell to Humanity's Childhood or Why This Is Not a Book About the Origins of Inequality This mood makes itself felt everywhere, politically, socially and philosophically. We are living in what the Greeks called the Keros, the right time for a metamorphosis of the gods, that is, of the fundamental principles and symbols. C. G. Young, The Undiscovered Self, 1958 Most of human history is irreparably lost to us. Our species, Homo sapiens, has existed for at least 200,000 years, but for most of that time we have next to no idea what was happening. In northern Spain, for instance, at the cave of Altamira, paintings and engravings were created over a period of at least 10,000 years, between around 25,000 and 15,000 BC. Presumably a lot of dramatic events occurred during this period. We have no way of knowing what most of them were. This is of little consequence to most people, since most people rarely think about the broad sweep of human history anyway. They don't have much reason to. Insofar as the question comes up at all, it's usually when reflecting on why the world seems to be in such a mess, and why human beings so often treat each other badly. The reasons for war, greed, exploitation, systematic indifference to others' suffering— were we always like that, or did something at some point go terribly wrong? It is basically a theological debate. Essentially, the question is, are humans innately good or innately evil? But if you think about it, the question framed in these terms makes very little sense. Good and evil are purely human concepts. It would never occur to anyone to argue about whether a fish or a tree were good or evil, because good and evil are concepts humans made up in order to compare ourselves with one another. It follows that arguing about whether humans are fundamentally good or evil makes about as much sense as arguing about whether humans are fundamentally fat or thin. Nonetheless, on those occasions when people do reflect on the lessons of prehistory, they almost invariably come back to questions of this kind. We are all familiar with the Christian answer. People once lived in a state of innocence, yet were tainted by original sin. We desired to be godlike and have been punished for it. Now we live in a fallen state while hoping for future redemption. Today, the popular version of this story is typically some updated variation on Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Discourse on the Origin and the Foundation of Inequality Among Mankind, which he wrote in 1754. Once upon a time, the story goes, we were hunter-gatherers, living in a prolonged state of childlike innocence, in tiny bands. These bands were egalitarian. They could be for the very reason that they were so small. It was only after the agricultural revolution, and then still more the rise of cities, that this happy condition came to an end, ushering in civilization and the state, which also meant the appearance of written literature, science and philosophy, but at the same time almost everything bad in human life. Patriarchy, standing armies, mass executions— and annoying bureaucrats demanding that we spend much of our lives filling in forms. Of course, this is a very crude simplification, 
but it really does seem to be the foundational story that rises to the surface whenever anyone, from industrial psychologists to revolutionary theorists, say something like, but of course human beings spent most of their evolutionary history living in groups of ten or twenty people, or agriculture was perhaps humanity's worst mistake. And as we'll see, many popular writers make the argument quite explicitly. The problem is that anyone seeking an alternative to this rather depressing view of history will quickly find that the only one on offer is actually even worse, if not Rousseau, then Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes's Leviathan, published in 1651, is in many ways the founding text of modern political theory. It held that humans, being the selfish creatures they are, life in an original state of nature was in no sense innocent. It must instead have been solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Basically, a state of war, with everybody fighting against everybody else. Insofar as there has been any progress from this benighted state of affairs, a Hobbesian would argue, it has been largely due to exactly those repressive mechanisms that Rousseau was complaining about. Government, courts, bureaucracies, police. This view of things has been around for a very long time as well. There's a reason why, in English, the words politics, polite, and police all sound the same. They're all derived from the Greek word polis, or city, the Latin equivalent of which is civitas, which also gives us civility, civic, and a certain modern understanding of civilization. Human society, in this view, is founded on the collective repression of our baser instincts, which becomes all the more necessary when humans are living in large numbers in the same place. The modern-day Hobbesian, then, would argue that, yes, we did live most of our evolutionary history in tiny bands, who could get along mainly because they shared a common interest in the survival of their offspring, parental investment, as evolutionary biologists call it. But even these were in no sense founded on equality. There was always in this version some alpha male leader. Hierarchy and domination and cynical self-interest have always been the basis of human society. It's just that, collectively, we have learned it to our advantage to prioritize our long-term interests over short-term instincts, or better, to create laws that force us to confine our worst impulses to socially useful areas, like the economy, while forbidding them everywhere else. As the listener can probably detect from our tone, we don't much like the choice between these two alternatives. Our objections can be classified into three broad categories. As accounts of the general course of human history, they, one, simply aren't true, two, have dire political implications, three, make the past needlessly dull. This audiobook is an attempt to begin to tell another, more hopeful and more interesting story, one which, at the same time, takes better account of what the last few decades of research have taught us. Partly, this is a matter of bringing together evidence that has accumulated in archaeology, anthropology, and kindred disciplines, evidence that points towards a completely new account of how human societies developed over roughly the last 30,000 years. Almost all of this research goes against the familiar narrative, but too often the most remarkable discoveries remain confined to the work of specialists or have to be teased out by reading between the lines of scientific publications. To give just a sense of how different the emerging picture is, it is clear now that human societies before the advent of farming were not confined to small egalitarian bands. On the contrary, the world of hunter-gatherers as it existed before the coming of agriculture was one of bold social experiments, resembling a carnival parade of political forms, far more than it does the drab abstractions of evolutionary theory. Agriculture, in turn, did not mean the inception of private property— nor did it mark an irreversible step towards inequality. In fact, many of the first farming communities were relatively free of ranks and hierarchies. 
and far from setting class differences in stone, a surprising number of the world's earliest cities were organized on robustly egalitarian lines, with no need for authoritarian rulers, ambitious warrior politicians, or even bossy administrators. Information bearing on such issues has been pouring in from every quarter of the globe. As a result, researchers around the world have also been examining ethnographic and historical material in a new light. The pieces now exist to create an entirely different world history, but so far they remain hidden to all but a few privileged experts, and even the experts tend to hesitate before abandoning their own tiny part of the puzzle to compare notes with others outside their specific subfield. Our aim in this audiobook is to start putting some of the pieces of the puzzle together, in full awareness that nobody has yet anything like a complete set. The task is immense, and the issues so important that it will take years of research and debate even to begin to understand the real implications of the picture we're starting to see. But it's crucial that we set the process in motion. One thing that will quickly become clear is that the prevalent big picture of history, shared by modern-day followers of Hobbes and Rousseau alike, has almost nothing to do with the facts. But to begin making sense of the new information that's now before our eyes, it is not enough to compile and sift vast quantities of data. A conceptual shift is also required. To make that shift means retracing some of the initial steps that led to our modern notion of social evolution. The idea that human societies could be arranged according to stages of development, each with their own characteristic technologies and forms of organization hunter gatherers, farmers, urban industrial society, and so on. As we will see, such notions have their roots in a conservative backlash against critiques of European civilization, which began to gain ground in the early decades of the 18th century. The origins of that critique, however, lie not with the philosophers of the Enlightenment, much though they initially admired and imitated it, but with indigenous commentators and observers of European society, such as the Native American Huron Wendat statesman Candiorong of whom we will learn much more in the next chapter. Revisiting what we will call the indigenous critique means taking seriously contributions to social thought that come from outside the European canon, and in particular from those indigenous peoples whom Western philosophers tend to cast either in the role of history's angels or its devils. Both positions preclude any real possibility of intellectual exchange or even dialogue. It's just as hard to debate someone who is considered diabolical as someone considered divine, as almost anything they think or say is likely to be deemed either irrelevant or deeply profound. Most of the people we will be considering in this book are long since dead. It is no longer possible to have any sort of conversation with them. We are nonetheless determined to write prehistory as if it consisted of people one would have been able to talk to when they were still alive, who don't just exist as paragons, specimens, sock puppets, or playthings of some inexorable law of history. There are certainly tendencies in history. Some are powerful, currents so strong that they are very difficult to swim against, though there always seem to be some who manage to do it anyway. But the only laws are those we make up ourselves, which brings us on to our second objection. Why both the Hobbesian and Rousseauian versions of human history have dire political implications. The political implications of the Hobbesian model need little elaboration, it is a foundational assumption of our economic system that humans are at base somewhat nasty and selfish creatures, basing their decisions on cynical, egoistic calculation rather than altruism or cooperation, in which case the best we can hope for are more sophisticated internal and external controls on our supposedly innate drive towards accumulation and self-aggrandizement. 
Rousseau's story about how humankind descended into inequality from an original state of egalitarian innocence seems more optimistic. At least there was somewhere better to fall from. But nowadays it's mostly deployed to convince.